keeping count. And I'm delighted to see so many of you staying with us. It's great. And I know people are coming in as they uh, want to specifically um, be present for a country discussion that they've sort of got their eye on. And uh, so that means we've got the Russia watchers in the room now. Um, so thank you for coming back or staying with us. Um, same format as before, we have got a great panel, and in fact we've got three already on the panel. I guess that means, yes, I'm thinking this through, it means our first speaker, who's going to give us our market report, our overview of what's happening in the, in the Russia market right now, is actually not going to join us on the panel, because she can't, but let me introduce her right now, and then I'll introduce the panel when we've heard our market overview. So welcome, please, Ekaterina Novitskaya. Um, from the ETOA, European Tour Operators, Operators Association. And Ekaterina is just going to give us an overview of Russia. So off you go. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's move on to Russia. Uh, the population of Russia in 2012 is estimated at 143 million. In the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, it was declining by around half percent a year, uh, but since then it has recovered and it uh, was declining by just around 0 0.1, 0.2 percent a year. Um, uh, there were times uh, in uh, 2000s when uh, the real GDP growth of Russia uh, almost reached 10 percent. Uh, however, uh, the uh, low demand and low prices in 2008 and 2009 for uh, hydrocarbon and other minerals pushed this uh, figure down to 2%. And uh, recently, it, uh, the growth recovered to 4.3% uh, in 2010, 2011 and it's predicted to be 3.7% uh, in 2012, and according to International Monetary Fund, it's gonna stay around the same figure in the next five years. Uh, the Russian economy has been thriving uh, on the basis of uh, high prices on uh, oil, gas, and minerals and also at the prevailing high international um, prices and high demand and huge experts of it. Uh, but the downside of that uh, is uh, such a called Dutch disease, uh, which uh, distracts all the investors um, uh, from the other sectors. Uh, and uh, this is coupled with uh, poor legal and institutional standards in Russia. And uh, uh, it resulted in a very strange uh, combination of very difficult uh, business operating conditions and, um, uh, which, which are coupled with a plenty of money in Russia. Uh, GDP per capita uh, in 2011, uh, almost reached $13,000. And um, this is much higher than the one in China, India, and South Africa, but this is more or less the same as we have in Brazil. And um, this uh, figure was flattened uh, in the beginning of uh, 2000s because of the international crisis of 1998. Uh, but it's recovered since 2005, and uh, uh, it has been growing since then uh, by around 3.6%. According to Boston Consulting Group, the uh, threshold of uh, $15,000 uh, allows the majority of the population to travel abroad and long-term journeys um, uh, quite easily. Uh, outbound trips from uh, Russia, as you can see from the table, they are growing from year to year, apart from uh, the crisis of 2008-2009, where we can uh, see a big drop on 18%. And uh, 
and it almost reached 44 million in 2011. Uh, Russians are very big spenders, as we know. Um, uh, they've been spending more and more money from one year to another, and again, except this uh, uh, drop of 12% of the crisis 2008 and 2009. Uh, according to international rankings, uh, Russians uh, were the seventh uh, biggest spenders in the world in 2000 and 11, and they've gone up since uh, uh, being ninth in 2010. Um, uh, regarding the airline capacity, uh, we can see that uh, it's been growing from year to year as well, and in 2012, number of flights reached around one and a half thousand and number of seats um, are over two hundred thousand. Uh, thanks for your attention. Спасибо за внимание. And this was my, these were my short notes. Спасибо. Thank you very much indeed, Ekaterina. Um, thank you indeed for that. Let me introduce uh, my um, my panel, right next to me, we have Alina Sham, uh, Sh Shamsuddinova, <laughs> Shamsuddinova, and I'd practiced that and then I sort of slightly forgot, but Alina, welcome. Alina is Sales and Marketing Director uh, of Business Services International, and in a moment, Alina, you can tell us exactly what uh, that London-based tour operator does in the Russian marketplace. Um, next to Alina is uh, Helene Lloyd, uh, who is director of the TMI consultancy, which I believe is a sort of market research consultancy business uh, with a lot of work in Russia and the former uh, Soviet yep. Union countries as well. So I want to hear a bit more about that, Helene. And then um, we've got Leslie back. And we heard Leslie earlier on. Uh, and Leslie's with uh, the European Travel Commission. So um, Russia, it is, I always think, you know, it, it raises a whole set of different issues and circumstances from the other countries that, you know, unfortunately sometimes we lump with it in terms of this dreaded BRICS acronym. Um, but Alina, tell me about your business and about your take on where uh, the Russian sort of tourism and travel market is right now. Services International. Uh, this is a company providing all the facilities for Russians and citizens of, from uh, CIS countries uh, to United Kingdom and Ireland. Uh, we provide all the facilities uh, starting from uh, visa support, um, accommodation, transfers. Uh, we provide our own excursions with Russian-speaking guides and all um, other facilities for VIP clients uh, starting for, from uh, VIP meet and greet at the um, uh, airport, uh, booking all the concert services like restaurants, clubs, etc. We also do a weekly groups program starting from Saturday. So we provide um, excursions for the Russians coming on a weekly basis. And um, what kind of numbers in, in the last year, say, have you had coming through using your services? Well, if we speak about an, um, on an annual basis, it's about two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. And what proportion of those travelers are from Russia and what proportion from the other countries that make up the CIS or the, the, the former Soviet states? Uh, well, of course, I mean, it's most of them Russians. I would say maybe 70, uh, 75%. And then uh, the rest, 25, is from CIS. And do you, you know, the, the Russian ec economic story is somewhat complicated. And as Katerina indicated it's sort of tied to the price of oil and gas to a certain extent, so it's not entirely predictable. Um, do you see a posi very positive and consistent growth trend, or do you worry about where that market is going? Well, I would say uh, at this moment we try to develop market of Azerbaijan, which is CS countries. The mm. Most of the oil and gas companies based there, so we tr uh, now we get more... Um, tourists and the business traveler from, from this country. 
Yeah, but I mean, I'm just thinking about Russia, your, by far your biggest marketplace. I mean, R Russia's economy too mm -hmm. does sort of succeed or fail according to the price of oil and gas to a certain extent. And I just wonder whether that, that may be a problem going forward, that it's still a, an economy that is, is, is too much tied to a very unpredictable and volatile set of commodity prices. Uh, well, if, uh, if we speak about uh, middle class people, mm. they, they all try to save money and they all travel in groups. And uh, if we speak about business travelers, um, I wouldn't say they, we, we touch this, uh, this, this, this group of people if we're talking about oil and gas industry. Right. So they, they, they don't care about money. Uh, they, uh, when they come to the United Kingdom, they, um, they really spend a lot of money. And we, uh, we even like, uh, don't touch any industry bases if we... Yes. Uh, Helene, let me ask you, are you um, very positive about the future of, of the Russian market and the strength of the Russian economy and therefore the you know, continued rise of, of numbers of people with, with enough expendable income to, to undertake vacations in Europe? Yeah, no, certainly it's a very dynamic market. It grows year on year, except for in 2009 when I think nearly all markets actually uh, had a reduction in the number of tourists. But even by 2010, there was a big increase again, and it overtook actually the figures from 2008. So it wasn't just an increase compared to 2009, it showed an overall aggregate growth. So it's 43 million people traveling abroad, um, some of them just going to other CIS countries, some going to Europe. The leisure figures that are actually shown are purely leisure, so they're actually a kind of underestimation of the number of people traveling. Mm. So it's, it's a big amount of people traveling. Europe is only three and a half hours away, or three hours in some cases, so it's not a long-haul destination. Sure. It's relatively cheap for Russians to come to Europe, and there's quite a lot of competition now uh, with flights. So this is not an expensive destination. But is it a hasslesome destination? Some uh, destinations, of course, are, um, how to say, limiting their potential due to the visas. But the V, um, basically what's happened over the last sort of five years, many of the European countries have set up a sort of system called visa offices. And they, uh, you know, in all the key uh, cities around Russia, so there's maybe, say, Greece will have 10 offices, Spain will have 15. So you can actually just go in your local town, submit your visa to the visa office, they deal with all the paperwork and you can pick it up, you know, in, mm. in four or five days' time. So it's not as difficult as it was in the past where people expected, you know, from Vladivostok to fly nine hours to Moscow to submit your visa, you know, basically asking people to go from London to further than New York in order to deal with a visa, which is crazy. So they are kind of dealing with that problem. Many countries are abolishing visas to Russians. Uh, Israel did that in 2009. Many of the Middle East countries, most of Latin America now has abolished visas. Really? So it's changing all the time. It's getting but, but better that, and better. But that's interesting because yeah. that means Europe uh, has a competitive disadvantage. You know, if, sure. if you're vi vying for the Russian travel and tourist dollar or ruble mm -hmm. and um, you have, you know, still somewhat time-consuming and vexing visa processes to go through, and some of your rival destinations don't, then you've got a problem. Yeah, in a way, it prevents people doing spontaneous travel. But many people, I can say our office in Moscow, we have um, all, mainly Russians working there, apart from myself, and many of them now, they were just offered multiple entry visas because they can see within Schengen that they're traveling frequently, so mm. they just go to get another French visa, and they say, okay, we'll give you one for three years. So the kind of upper middle class, if you like, uh, are really actually not having so many problems with visas as in the past because it's much easier to get a visa, a multiple entry visa. Britain normally does that. If you've been three times to Britain, come back without any problems, they can offer you a multiple entry visa over a number of years or a year or three years. So it is slowly, I mean, it's really so much better than it was eight or ten years ago. It is inconvenient. It is a hassle. Uh, people would travel much more. I'm sure there would be like a thousand percent increase overnight if visas were removed to the Schengen zone and to Britain. But um, meanwhile, the figures still grow. Places like Greece got 56% growth last year. Um, Spain, I think, got around 57%. They're also very high growth figures, what I've seen for the first half of this year. So it's not stopping the growth, actually. Particularly Southern Europe, it's a traditional place where Russians go on holiday in the summer, and they're not going to change that, I don't think. Right. Visas or no visas. 
visas well, as I, the nearest place to come. Sure. I mean, I knew that we mm. would need to talk about visas a little bit, but the other thing I think we have to talk about a little bit is, um, is, is systemic corruption and mm -hmm. the difficulties of doing business in Russia if you're, you know, from outside Russia and in certain sectors of business and industry we've seen Western companies really struggle. I think that's to more work in the in oil Russia. and gas industry. I don't think you'll see much of that in the tourism industry, no? frankly speaking. I don't because it's it's a wide open market. I mean, there's huge competition. Uh, there's very little room to, you know, to do anything, frankly speaking. How, how, how does it work in Russia? How do most Russians book their vacations, their holidays, how do they do it? Uh, depends uh, where they're going, uh, what age groups they're from, which segment of the market they're from. If, you, if you're talking about the upper middle class, the rather sophisticated travellers who look very similar to any European upper middle class person, they're often booking online mm. because they already have a multiple entry visa, or if they're going to a non-visa country, they don't have to deal with a visa, so they're more likely to book directly. If they're a first-time traveller, somebody from the Russian region, somebody maybe not speaking a foreign language, they probably would prefer to book through a tour operator, so through a travel agency. And then within that whole sector, you've got the large tour operators who distribute their packages to all the travel industry. You've also got the kind of VIP sector, which is like luxury travel agents who are really serving, say, 100, 150 high uh, income clients. And they're not focused on a particular destination. They're focused on the individual, where they want to go, right. what they want to do. They go to them for ideas for consultation. So you've got quite a sophisticated element of the travel market working and, there. Okay, and Alina, we, you know, we, in the different countries we've discussed today, we've talked about um, the nature of the typical, if there is such a thing, the typical traveller from those countries. Talk me through your customers, the typical Russian travellers that you work with. What do they want out of a destination? You know, what really gets them fired up, what gives them a buzz, what, 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 when they book a holiday, what are they looking for? Well, because I'm, um, I'm based in the United Kingdom and we do inbound tourism to UK and Ireland, I can speak only about mm. Great Britain. So I would say that tourist from Russia is about like 24 to 44 years old, mm. which is quite a young person, um, more male than female traveling, and they're all looking for, for the traditional heritage, um, uh, more educational and exciting tours uh, rather than relaxing. So they prefer, they, uh, they think that uh, spent one week in Great Britain, uh, it's much better than spending a week in France or somewhere in the Schengen, Schengen country. Um, if we talk about even visas, um, yeah, it's more difficult maybe to get a visa to United Kingdom rather than uh, Schengen countries. But um, we've got about 12 and a half million uh, people, uh, leisure clients, um, out of 40 million travelers. And um, of course, I mean, the, uh, London is an international capital, so most of them, they're coming for a business, but still, uh, it's so many things to do in London, as well as sure. the United Kingdom, like well, a whole. Well, we, we do see plenty of Russians in London, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, so we work quite well. Yes. <laughs> Leslie, um, you, you sort of take a European overview of this. Is it likely, do you think, any time soon that there will be visa-free travel from Russia to uh -huh. Europe? Well, uh, I, th I think it's more, the, the discussion goes beyond tourism. My, 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 my understanding also from the country in which I work, which is, which is, which is Malta. Um, the, the issue of Schengen visas um, revolves around a wider set of discussions. Uh, between the EU and uh, Russia. Yes, well, so, on the basis so of that, it doesn't look very good because, frankly, relations between mm. Putin's government and a whole bunch of mm. Western governments haven't been particularly good recently. So, and I, I would dare speculate in, in, in terms of what you are saying that, that the visa issue becomes a bargaining chip right. in, these, in, these, in these relations. Nevertheless, in line with, 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 the other, uh, with, with what the other panelists have said, in spite of the visa issue, the Russian market remains big for, for, for a lot of European destinations, but whether it, they're in Schengen or not. Yeah, but it's interesting you've introduced the idea of a political context, because I was very struck in our debate about um, China when one of the panelists said, ah, yeah, well, you know, there was a particular problem, a political problem between the Chinese government and the West, and, and we saw an immediate impact mm -hmm. on bookings, because yes. a lot of Chinese visitors thought, well, you know what, right now I'll 
I'll opt out. I mean, are you, is the Russian marketplace as vulnerable to political chill between... I don't think so. I no? think the Russian no. travelers are much more independent. Uh -huh. I can certainly remember, was it in 2010 when Egypt had a problem and actually, you know, many countries just stopped sending tourists there and tourists themselves stopped going there. Yeah. The Russians, Russians carried going. on going, carrying mm -hmm. on going, and right. the Russian government kept saying to the tour operators, please don't send any more charters, please don't send any more charters. And at a certain point, they said, listen, stop t sending charters, because right. if not, it's, we're going to do something to you. You know, So they were really imposed on them, because the public are quite independent really? and uh, will do whatever. They bought their holiday, they wanted right. to go to Egypt, and they, nobody was going to stop them. So frankly, travel advisories wouldn't affect them? or uh, Not so much. Mm. Of course, there is some influence. I remember that there was uh, a travel advisory about Spain. There was a problem, I think, to do with this... Uh, um, um, not mad cow's disease, something right. that was going but on. But I was thinking more just a political you know. chill between governments, you know. I mean, for example, mm. it hasn't happened because Mitt Romney's lost the election, but Mitt Romney was saying, you know, Russia, in my view, is our number one strategic enemy. Mm -hmm. So you can't imagine the relations between a Mitt Romney administration and Putin's Russia would have been very good. Sure. And I just wonder, you know, when tour operators are wondering whether to invest mm -hmm. big time in the Russian marketplace, whether they ought to be worried about the potential uh, politics that surrounds Russia's relationship with various Western countries. I, I, I wouldn't see the risk as high as it is with markets like China. I mean, with, with, with the China example, more recently, destinations like Japan and the Philippines are mm. feeling the heat yeah. because of the, the, the islands. Regional uh, issues, issues yeah. um, Where demand actually dries up very visibly and very quickly. But, 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 but I, do, I do tend to agree that the Russian market is, is much more, first of all, there's a longer history. It's, it's, it's much more developed. It's, it's shorter haul, and the travelers have evolved to become much more independent in, in, their, in, in, in the way they, 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 they view right. uh, their, their travel choices. Although, I mean, you're, so you're painting a picture of incredibly independent Russians wandering all around Europe. But Alina, your, yours perspective slightly different, your, your Russians are coming on very organized packages. Uh, well, um, online bookings uh, growing up right now in Russia, it's about 11% already uh, of Russians, they book online. So they, they try and now they learn mm. how to book their, their trip themselves. Right. So they, uh, they now mostly use booking.com <laughs> as well, it's quite popular website in Russia. Uh, they do book services online as well as transfers and um, excursions. So they, um, they, uh, they now try uh, sort of, as Helen uh, Wright said, uh, the middle class, so they try to, to save money and they try to book uh, everything possible online. Uh, yeah. When um, high level people, um, they, they have their own PAs who use us or other travel agents who book everything for them here. Okay. Who, who would like to ask a question or make a comment about the Russian market um, and what's going on in, in Russia today? Yes, we've got a, a hand up here. Let's get you the microphone. Good afternoon, Suzanne. I'm a student. I want to ask another question about the economic aspects of the, um, of the tourism in Russia. You told us that a lot of Russians go to Spain or Greece and actually, in Spain and Greece, we have a little bit of an economic crisis. Do they go in other, other countries? Have you seen the number of Russian increase, for example, in Germany, because they can't go in Spain or they don't want to go in Spain or Greece? They want to go in Spain and Greece. And yes. The numbers were over 50%, yeah. so it hasn't deterred them at all. Yeah, I think oh. Spanish yeah. embassies are the most busiest embassies in, in Russia now. Mm. So it, despite a couple of years of financial fear and crisis in Spain and Greece, that doesn't I affect... I think it attracts, because it actually hotels you know, they think they're are, get better are more able more to affordable. negotiate. You know, there's always, a, if you offer a discount or you offer right. an extra, Russians are very inclined to be, you know, tempted by that. Right. So, uh, you know, Turkey actually had this year a small decrease, I think around about 12%, and a lot of that was picked up by Greece, because the hotel prices went down slightly in Greece, and in Turkey mm. they're gradually rising every year, even though Turkey is still the number one destination. I was going to say, Tur Turkey must be a huge market. It's the number one destination, but I tell you what, Greece and Spain are not snapping at their heels. They're all there in the top, you know, five or six, so they're catching up pretty fast. And if they didn't have visas, 
they right. would be a hard competition, I think, for and, Turkey. And, and, and where does plucky old Britain fit? Um, plucky old Britain fits in the top 20, <laughs> still. <laughs> top 20? <laughs> uh, yeah, the most popular countries are Turkey, Egypt and uh, China for 2010, mm -hmm. because none of these countries required a visa for the Russian people. Right. Yeah. Well, China, a couple of weeks ago, announced that um, they need a visa for the Russians to come. Yeah. So it might be... But Some Alina, I hate to tell you, but you're in the wrong country then. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you've pulled but the short straw. It's the highest spend tourist that comes. The uh, best yes. level of tourists, it's the, the highest spend. Tourist. So, you know, it's, it's a different segment of the market, I would say, right. maybe, than okay. the Egypt uh, tourists. Well, I, it, Egypt's interesting, because I was in Cairo mm. last week when the British government, there was a bit of confusion about it, but it seemed to be issuing another travel advisory saying, Sinai don't go to, and the whole of Egypt has a high terror risk, and then it seemed they retracted a bit of this advice. But nonetheless... It, it, what you're saying is the Russian holidaying public wouldn't necessarily have been put off by it's that. It's a very robust public. Wow, they amazing. don't necessarily believe everything that's written. And if you offer a good uh, promotion <laughs> alongside it, they can totally ignore that. Well, you risk. certainly got a yeah. good deal in Egypt today. So, <laughs> so I guess on that basis, they'll be going there in huge numbers. All right. Uh, any other Russia thoughts or questions? We'd love any. Uh, yeah, go on. Hi, Nick Greenfield, ETOA. I'm curious what the panel think about the idea that quite a lot of us would like to go to Russia. I went to Russia for the first time this year. It's a very expensive long weekend trip. The visa's easy, but it costs a lot of money. But the more that people from Russia come to the rest of Europe, and we go from Europe to Russia, will that also help cultural exchange and encourage people to travel more? Because I'm quite keen on this idea that that's something. We tend to see Russia as somewhere else, as not particularly European. But surely travel can help in that way. Well, I don't know what the panel thinks about that. Yeah, I think it's very important. And I think that Russia is part of Europe. It's definitely part of the European family. And if you've been to Moscow, you'll see it's, it's seeped deeply in European culture. So I think that it certainly helps the more people travel. I think I've even seen service levels increase hugely in Moscow just because people travel abroad and they say, I want this now. I no longer want this lower level. You've got to hit the international But if that, if that reciprocal arrangement is really helpful and beneficial to Russia in the long run, why on earth are visas to Russia so expensive? You know, it's really off-puttingly expensive. Yeah, um, it's outsourced to a private company. Well, so that's not that's very, very good efficient. Excuse. It's well, extremely efficient. <laughs> that, that, that just makes me even more <laughs> furious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, somebody's making vast profits off the back of anybody who needs to get into Russia. Yeah, no, it's not a very tourism-friendly uh, policy. It's it's true. Have you discussed this with your Russian friends? Um, I think the thing is that actually, if you apply directly and you apply with a five-day lead period is actually not that expensive. It's much cheaper than the British visa. Yeah, but <laughs> because the British visa is also very expensive. Is it? <laughs> yeah. How, yes. much is the British, how much is the British visa? Yeah, I think it's about 76 pounds. Well, the... 78 pounds. You mean to get, a, to get a British visa in Russia? Yeah. Yes. And how, I, I, Nick, you, how much is the visa you need to get here to go to Russia? Uh, I think... Oh, well, oh there we are, sorry. Yeah. Um, Helen's put her finger on it because a lot of people going over there, they will use a special service. I used a fast track service because uh, I found out very last minute and it cost me 120 yeah, exactly. something pounds. Yeah, me too, but, but that's because you're doing it fast track. If you did go through the slower process, it's true that it's a lot less. Really but the, but the trouble is, is I see it, the Russian market, St. Petersburg and, and yes. Moscow, St. Petersburg are members of our association, they, they would love to get more European visitors on short and long weekend yeah. city breaks. But you know, the flight, my flight costs less than the visa exactly. to Moscow. Yeah. But, but it's, I agree with the idea that it is a little bit of a political bargaining chip. And the trouble as well is that you have um, 26 countries in Schengen, mm -hmm. and they're all having these sort of bilateral negotiations with one country. So Putin or Medvedev will say, tomorrow we will abolish visas. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's, he knows also that they're having all these bilateral ideas. You ask the Greeks, you ask the Spanish, would you like to abolish visas tomorrow? They say yes. You ask the Germans or sure. you ask the, the Brits, they're a little more reluctant. Yes, indeed. Well, yeah. I'm not sure that's going to change anytime soon. But yeah. um, any other... I just, uh, yeah, yeah, just would like to add, like uh, Nick said, um, that yeah, you can get a visa here like in two days, but you need to pay some extra money. Russians, unfortunately, don't have such a service. They maybe wish to pay like about 100 pounds extra, but mm. 
That you can't, in Russia. No. You can't do the fast track in Russia. No. no. Okay. Only in St. Petersburg you can, but this is only one city. Right. All right. Anybody else? Um, right. Madam Yu, and then Madam Yu at the back. But um, staying on subject of visas, we know that lately um, USA visas have been relaxed, Russia, USA. How did this reflect um, kind of traffic between two countries, taking in account the frosty relationship, let's say, in the, in the past between two countries? Has it been like rapidly increased? It has definitely increased. I don't have the figure actually on me, but um, definitely it's a positive trend for sure. And there's a lot more agencies now selling the USA. So the minute you see some sort of change in the visas, it always has an impact. But presumably there's a big price differential in the, in the ticket, if nothing else, to get to America. Sure. Um, but if you just look at any country, as soon as they drop the visa, it's just big boom usually. Yeah. I remember Israel was, I think, 160% increase. So if you want an increase, just reduce or make the visas easier, right. or, you know, like the United States did. I, I don't know the percentage increase, but it's, it's definitely a good increase. Yes, right. We'll have to make this the last one because um, we're slightly short of time. Go on, ma'am. Yes, I just want to ask how easy it is to set up a company in Russia uh, in the travel business. Good question. <laughs> Who knows the answer? I can only talk about a foreign representation, which is the system that I have. So I have a British company which is registered in Russia as a foreign representation. That's extremely easy and straightforward. But that means that you don't actually trade with Russian companies. Um, if you want to set up as a commercial entity, if you're going to be a branch of a foreign company, I also don't think it's very difficult. They've done a lot of streamlining over the last four to five years to make it as simple as possible. And the Russian government's really trying to encourage foreign investors and highly educated foreign people to come and work in Russia. So they've also hugely simplified the visa system, the ability to get a work permit, because they want to attract <coughs> highly skilled people and business. So but it's but much, I have to say, easier. Helen, you, I mean, you paint a very rosy picture. I've had people on Hard Talk, you know, very big business people who worked in Russia, mm. invested huge amounts of money in Russia, and been very badly burned uh, by the corruption w within the official system there, who have said to me, you know, any business person looking to invest in Russia right now needs their head examining. I mean... The, the, the um, I think it's an over... Maybe it's for certain sectors, but if you look at IKEA, IKEA's opened, I don't know, 15 different shops there. They, it's their principle, they say up front, we never pay anyone one ruble, one euro. We just don't bribe. If it takes us longer, it'll take us longer. And they always come out in all their press conferences and all their information saying, we've never bribed anyone in Russia. We're never going to do that. We make 80% of our furniture, which we sell in Russia, in Russia. So I think, you know, as an international example, that's somebody who's just excelled. Sure, it maybe I mean, depends, you, you, you know, if you're in the oil and gas You can trade examples, you can talk about William Browder and yeah. Heritage Capital and what mm. happened to them. I mean, I guess my feeling is you just have to be aware. It's a pretty, you know, it sure, can be a pretty you're, rough, you're not, tough environment. Yeah. I think, you know, if you go to many European countries, it's not that easy to set up a business either. There's a lot of bureaucracy, there's yeah. a lot of red tape. Um, Russia's tried to cut that down. The level of corruption, like I say, is more likely to affect you if you're a Russian company, frankly speaking. As a foreign company, you're kind of insulated up to a point from that. Well, if you are, madam, setting up a business in Russia, good luck. Come back <laughs> next year and tell us how it's going. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think we have to draw a close there because we've got one more session to do, ladies and gentlemen, and we're, we're right on our deadline. So please give a, a warm hand to our Russia panel. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. And we'll start again in two minutes. Two minutes, ladies and gentlemen.